This evening, Books and Books is very happy to present Ms. Cynthia Barnett and her new book, Rain, A Natural and Cultural History, very appropriate for this evening. Ms. Barnett is a longtime journalist who has reported on fresh water from the Suwannee River to Singapore. Her first book, Mirage, Florida and the Vanishing Water of the Eastern U.S., won the gold medal for best nonfiction in the Florida Book Awards and was named by the Tampa Bay Times as one of the top 10 books that every Floridian should read. Her book, Blue Revolution, Unmaking America's Water Crisis, was named by the Boston Globe as one of the top 10 science books of 2011. And we have both of those books for sale at the counter tonight as well. Ms. Barnett has worked for newspapers and magazines for 25 years, winning numerous journalism awards. She earned her bachelor's degree in journalism and master's in environmental history, both from the University of Florida, and spent a year as a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan. Although it is the subject of countless poems and paintings, the top of the weather report, and the source of the world's water, here she gives us the first book to tell the story of rain. Please give a very warm welcome to Ms. Cynthia Barnett. There you go. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for being here. This is actually Rain's first public event. The book just came out today, so I really appreciate you being here. And um, for reasons you'll hear a little later, the first public event for Rain had to be in Miami. I live in Gainesville, but I sort of had to do this here, and, and you'll hear why uh, a little later. Um, exactly, but my I kind of think of Miami as the spiritual home for this book because I, I always have loved rain in Miami. So I'm really grateful. Victor, thank you. Before you leave, I want to thank uh, Books and Books for hosting the launch day event. And I'm so grateful to be speaking in the bookstore named the number one bookstore in the nation this year by Publishers Weekly. That was so awesome. Yeah. So thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. So, so over the past four years, as I've told people, I'm working on a history of, of rain. The question I get is why? Why would you ever do that? And um, part of the answer is that I'm crazy about rain. I'm a Florida native, and I have always loved our dramatic thunderstorms. Um, sun showers and the wonderful weirdness that happens here, right? That's the kind of place where it can rain in the front yard and not in the backyard and all of those wonderful things. So, um, but the deeper answer is that this seed was really planted by readers of my first two books, um, Mirage and Blue Revolution. And as I would go around the state and around the country talking about those two books, I found that even people who don't want to talk about climate change or refuse to talk about climate change, they still love to talk about the weather, right? They love to talk about extreme rain and drought and um, increased thunderstorms and all of those things. So um, one drizzly Friday afternoon, it hit me that I really should try to write the story of rain. and. I felt sure that someone would have already done it, um, but, but they hadn't. And, and once I started reporting on the, the cultural and the natural history, I really kind of became obsessed with the topic, which, which you have to do to write a book. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, this book and, and my approach and my reporting as a journalist, and then I'm going to read you some bits. and then. You can ask me any questions you want. And I, um, before, uh, before I read you this, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of the philosophy behind this book. I, I am an environmental journalist. I really write full time on water and climate. That's what I do. And I've written two books that were a little bit more prescriptive, but I got very sick of writing for the environmental qu choir all the time, right? I don't want to do that. I want to reach um, the large middle that I call the caring middle, people who really would care 
about all of these environmental issues if they only knew. So one reason that I decided to approach this book not as a hard science book or a prescriptive book, but try to write more lyrically about rain, try to write about the poetry of rain and the scent of rain, and that was to try to bring more readers to the story of our climate and our weather. So um, I decided to start at the beginning uh, with the rains that filled the oceans 4.6 billion years ago. But again, I didn't want rain to be wonky. And so from the opening chapter, I weave the cultural history with the science, including literary history, because so many of our beloved writers have been inspired by rain. And Ray Bradbury was one of those writers. Um, so I'll read you the opening scene to give you a feel um, for, for him and for how I blend cultural history and, and science in this book. The rain on Mars was gentle and welcome. Sometimes the rain on Mars was blue. One night, rain fell so marvelously upon the fourth planet from the sun that thousands of trees sprouted and grew overnight, breathing oxygen into the air. When Ray Bradbury gave Mars a livable atmosphere in the Martian Chronicles, science fiction purists grumbled that it was completely implausible. In the previous century, astronomers and writers like H.G. Wells, who borrowed from their work to give sci-fi a tantalizing authenticity, had seen Mars as Earth-like, odds-on favorite for life on a planet other than our own. But by the time the Martian Chronicles was published in 1950, those odds had changed. Scientists viewed Mars as chokingly dry, impossibly harsh, and far too cold for rain. Bradbury didn't care to conform to the scientific views of the day. On any planet, he was much more interested in the human story. He created a rain-soaked Venus too, but not because scientists then considered it a galactic swamp. As a boy, he had loved the summer rains of Illinois and those that fell during family vacations in Wisconsin. Hawking newspapers on a Los Angeles street corner as a teen, Bradbury never minded a late afternoon deluge. And in his 80 years of writing every day, raindrops tap, tap, tapped from the typewriter keys into many a short story and every book. A Bradbury rain could set a gentle scene or a creepy one. It could create moods of gloom, of mania, or joy. In his short story, The Long Rain, he made rain a character all its own. It was a hard rain, a perpetual rain, a sweating and steaming rain. It was a mizzle, a downpour, a fountain, a whipping at the eyes, an undertow at the ankles. It was a rain to drown all rains and the memory of rains. So often making rain the maison scène for life, Bradbury was on to something. Everyone knows that life could not have developed without water. Life as we define it required a wet and watery planet. But the earth as exceptional blue marble story many of us grew up with is in some ways as much a product of the human imagination as the warm Mars Sea of the Martian Chronicles. Modern scientists have good evidence that Earth did not develop as the sole wet and watery orb in our solar system. Earth, Mars, and Venus were born of the same batch of flying fireballs. All three boasted the same remarkable feature, water. What's exceptional about our blue marble is not that we had water, it's that we held on to it and that we still do. While the ancient oceans of Venus and Mars vaporized into space, Earth kept its life-giving water. Luckily for us, the forecast called for rain. So that is uh, the, opening, the opening couple of pages. Um, 
And by the way, has anyone, has anyone seen the film, The Illustrated Man? Do you remember the Rod Steiger film? So this is uh, one of the, I, I made a top 10 list of my favorite rain scenes in movies of all time. And this was, this was up there because it's just such a, it's from that short story, The Long Rain. And it's just a miserable, incredible rain. Kind of a cheesy movie compared with the short story, but it's still a great rain scene. So the human relationship with rain uh, stretches all the way back to our evolution in soggy times from the rainforests of East Africa. Um, and, and scientists call these pluvial times, these times in, in our history when it rains a lot for hundreds of thousands or thousands of years. So uh, these pluvial times predate human memory, but we can literally touch them with our fingers. Just take a look at the wrinkles that rise on your fingers and toes after a good soak. Popular belief long had it that this pruny effect was caused by osmosis. Our digits must absorb water and swell up, rippling the skin into little folds. But a neurobiologist named Mark Changizi figured out that this pruniness actually comes from the autonomic nervous system, so a largely involuntary control panel in the lower brain stem that also controls things like breathing and swallowing. Other primates get the finger wrinkles too. Um, so an automatic physical trigger to water suggested to uh, Dr. Changizi that this is an adaptation. Um, primates would not have had to evolve to deal with porcelain bathtubs, right? But they would have had to adapt to rain. And Changizi's research shows that finger wrinkles are essentially rain treads. Smooth fingers grip best in dry times, but wrinkly fingers help us hang on when it's wet. The wrinkles form quickly enough to gear up for rainy conditions, but not so fast that if you just had casual contact of, with water, they would, they would pop up. Um, so Changizi says these are clues to an ancient adaptation for gripping in the rainy forest where human ancestors lived some 10 million years ago. And I just love that. I love that we can see our ancestors in our fingers. And I also love the more I've read about this, these studies, the more I love the way these channels look. They remind me of rain channels, you know, coming down a mountain to the sea. If you, if you look at them and some of the other um, graphics that he's got online, it's, it's pretty remarkable. So rain, a, a real theme in this book is that rain-shaped human history, obviously. And another theme in the book is that we also, um, we also have come to impact the rain, but for most of our history, we were just trying, we didn't really make any difference to the climate. We were just trying really hard. We did everything we could to try to control rain or bring it or stop it. And so um, one of the very first, uh, one of the very first gods ever, um, was a, a deity of storms and rain. In Mesopotamia, this little guy was known as Iskur by the Sumerians or Adad by the Akkadians. And uh, he was a lightning bolt wielding god who stood balanced on the back of a galloping bull riding through a wild tempest in the sky. Um, but I went to see him in the Louvre and he actually did not look very fierce at all <laughs> behind his glass behind his glass case there. Um, so our dependence on rain and rain's seeming capriciousness to him, humanity um, really led to a great influence on rain and religion. So I devote a whole chapter to rain and religion. It's called Praying for Rain. Um, and so the greatest rain story, the greatest rain story of all time, of course, um, Noah and the Great Flood appears in many, many iterations, even long before the Bible was, was put to paper. So I write, I write about many of those flood myths. 
Um, the monotheism of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism all grew out of the arid sands of the Middle East. And I, I found that so interesting that um, some historians trace monotheism to agriculturalists in these dry lands looking to the sky, you know, wishing and praying for that life-giving rainfall. And um, interestingly, most of the polytheistic religions were born in the region of the soaking monsoons. So um, that's one, uh, one, one difference that some of the religion scholars dive into. So um, another, another little, little detail I love um, that I learned about rain is that in Hinduism, the beloved god Krishna is blue to represent a rainstorm. In fact, his name means dark as a storm cloud. So some scholars speculate that as people evolved their belief systems in radically different climate conditions, they took rad radically different approaches to interacting with God, nature, and one another. So I dig into that in the, um, in the Praying for Rain chapter, but it's also got its share of fun um, you know, up to modern times when our modern Christian governors uh, pray for a storm in, in Texas and in Georgia and so on. Oops, sorry guys, I'm not used to this clicker yet. So over the course of history, we turn out to be remarkably adaptable to climate changes. And that's, that's another, another theme here. When, you, when you, you know read what's happened to us over the course of history, it's completely amazing that we're still here, right? So um, we survive many extreme droughts, including the one 4,000 years ago that wiped out the four early civilizations of the great river valleys, so the Nile in ancient Egypt, the Tigris Euphrates in Mesopotamia, the Yellow River in China, and the Indus in ancient India. And, um, you know, so we, it, we survived those epic droughts, and then we also survived some incredible pluvial times. And I, uh, I should say hellacious pluvial times. So, so I write about... Um, those sorts of trends, again, without trying to hit you over the head and um, you know, make it a heavy, a heavy climatology book, it really is weaving that uh, climate story and weather story with the cultural history of all of these places. Um, so in medieval Europe, the 1300s marked the beginning of a five-century climate shift known as the Little Ice Age. That century, some of the most extreme rains in a thousand years, along with copious floods and early and late frosts, led to widespread loss of crops, homes, and entire villages, starvation, and ultimately a great paranoia. These rains brought an increase in witch hunts, witch trials, and witch executions as people began to believe it was witches who were conjuring the storms. Um, one of the most infamous storm-related witch persecutions um, that I was fascinated to research um, was carried out by King James VI. And yes, this is the same King James who gave us the King James Bible. Um, when he was king of Scotland, he wanted to marry a princess, um, Anna of Denmark and she was supposed to come over and these freak storms kept keeping her um, from making her way across the North Sea and then again more he he went to go try and save her and more incredible freak storms um, you know seemed to keep his ship from getting to her and he just became more and more paranoid some people in the culture you know, we're really believing in witchcraft. He, he was trying to be intellectual and not believe it. But by the time he was in the middle of those storms being kept from his bride, he really came to believe that the storms of this really stormy time in history were being conjured up by, by witches. And he became convinced that what the devil was trying to kill him. And so um, 
I tell this story, I won't dwell on it too much, but I'll tell you that an aging midwife named Agnes Sampson and a schoolmaster named James Fyan paid unspeakably for these uh, squalls. And they were among thousands. There were thousands of um, witches, accused witches, tortured, hanged and burned for the devilish snows, rains, freezes, floods, harvest failures, sickness, infertility, livestock epidemics, and other miseries that plagued Europe in the years between 1560 and 1660. And the worst of the witchcraft persecutions line up with the worst years of the Little Ice Age. Um, so for all of human history, we have pined to get the upper hand over the weather, over the rain, over the atmosphere, right? King James thought he could do it by executing witches. Um, this, this one is a little pamphlet they put out called News from Scotland that tells the whole story. It tells the whole story from King James's point of view, and it's a fascinating little pamphlet. And you can see his ship over on the left getting tossed at sea and then on the right you know the the image of the witches uh, stirring the cauldron to um, stir up the storm and then this um, this one is is a woodcut from the same period you see a lot of artwork um, like this during during the period so um, in the light of the scientific revolution we begin to use measurement and observation to forecast what the weather would do next, um, but that that was like a difficult that was a difficult shift to make. And this um, this I won't get to Thomas Jefferson yet. I'll just tell you a little story about the early forecasting. There seems to be an interesting shift between America and the UK um, at the time during the Scientific Revolution when forecasting. Um, was just invented and scientists were starting to figure out that if you knew what the weather did a couple of days before some, somewhere else, you could predict what it was going to do in your part of the world. And the people in England did not accept it. They felt it was voodoo. They were, they were really afraid of it at the beginning and they just they didn't accept it. And, and in fact, um, Admiral, Admiral Fitzroy the wonderful scientist who really invented uh, forecasting. Before that, he had been the captain of Darwin's Beagle. He actually ended up committing suicide. Um, so, you know, pilloried was he by these critics who said forecasting was voodoo. And the, um, the, national, um, the national government stopped forecasting in England for 12 years because people um, didn't believe in it or thought it was thought it was voodoo, and you know if you can you can imagine how many people must have been killed at sea. You know sailors killed at sea because they didn't have access to those forecasts. Now Americans were completely different. We loved forecasting. We we loved the idea. We wanted the forecasts. As soon as the telegraph line came, there were hundreds and hundreds of little weather centers all over the country that could give people the forecast, and we really liked that. So I, I was thinking that that relationship is kind of flipped, because now in the UK, um, people really accept climate change, and they, they listen to, to climate scientists and climate forecasting, and here we're more skeptical of uh, climate science. So that, that feels kind of interesting to me. So anyway, I wrote a book of rain. I had to write about the man I call our founding forecaster, Thomas Jefferson. Um, Thomas Jefferson loved weather. He was, always, he was in this really interesting fight with the scientists in Europe about who had the more salubrious rains. He thought, he thought we had better weather, and they argued that they had better weather, and they thought, you know, the scientists of Europe thought America was this dismal, dank, swampy, awful place, and Thomas Jefferson was always trying to set them straight, and I tell some of those stories in the book. So um, I have a lot about him in, in this chapter, but also kind of sprinkled throughout the book because he's so important to our weather consciousness, and he actually, he actually collected every drop of rain that fell upon him for about 50 years. He measured rainfall. 
he measured rainfall and he took really detailed notes in his little weather memorandum book. Um, but the interesting thing, the thing I love about Jefferson and the irony in the story that I tell is that um, he ultimately didn't do any better than the Mesopotamians or King James at controlling the rain. If you've ever been to visit his brilliant Monticello in Charlottesville, Virginia, you know the home is surrounded by beautiful cisterns. He was, he was convinced that he could build on his beautiful little mountain. He did not need to build near the river because he was going to have cisterns and he would collect all of his rain and it would be easy. Um, well, in fact, his cisterns never worked. Um, and in fact, uh, there, I quote an architectural historian in the book who figured out that Martha Jefferson spent one fifth of her married life with no readily available source of water at the house because those cisterns just turned out to be such a disaster. And when, um, when there was a drought, um, they didn't have water. And of course, slavery really skewed, skewed the realities for them because they had slaves who could, you know, schlep down to the river and, and carry it all the way up this hill. Um, but it, it was a really ironic story, right? That the same person who was so committed to, um, to the weather science, he too, you know, it was like the Mesopotamian rain god and then King James and now even Thomas Jefferson, we can't really seem to control this, right, to get our, to get our arms around it. So that is the case with many, many famous men. Uh, many of Frank Lloyd's Wright, Lloyd Wright's beautiful roofs leak terribly. The largest single collection of his buildings is found at Florida Southern College in Lakeland. The dozen right structures there are known collectively as child of the sun, out of the ground and into the light, a child of the sun, as, as Wright described his work there. But Lakeland is known more for its rain. Lakeland, Florida is the thunderstorm capital of the United States. It has more storms rolling in than any other single city in the country. And so um, Frank Lloyd writes, roofs famously leak they leak all over the country and he's got this great quote that's how you know it's a roof so his um i've got great great stuff about people who loved frank lloyd wright's architecture and they would get him to build their house and they would call him they would call him to you know yell at him during a rainstorm and he was just like hey that's how you know it's a roof Frank Lloyd Wright actually loved rain, and it's wonderful to go to Florida Southern College in a rainstorm because the sidewalks are covered with these, um, these, these walkways, the covered walkways, and so you can walk in a rainstorm and really be in the rain and appreciate it, and it's falling all around you, but you're not getting wet, and, and all of that is by design. He really loved weather. He wasn't being arrogant about the weather so much as just letting it in, including, including in the roofs. So um, I don't want to take too much of your time, but going back to control, I want to I'll get, get us forward in history a little bit. I was just going to read you about our America's first official meteorologist. Um, his name was James Pollard Espy, and he was a really brilliant guy. Um, except for this one idea that he had. And I'll just, I'll just read you this part. So I have a whole chapter called The Rainmakers. And we have this crazy part of American history um, where people really thought they could blast rain out of the sky with mortars meant for war. And it's, it's amazing and it's fun. And these guys are working all over the country. They work in California during drought times. They work all over the Midwest. But for a while, one of our, our first government meteorologists be believed some of this too, so I'll just read you this little bit. In 1842, the US government had hired its first official meteorologist, the brilliant James Pollard Espy, widely admired at home and in Europe. SB had championed the national system of weather observation, uh, observers, the only information now wanted to predict rain. His convective theory of rainfall, which explained how storms are driven by warm, humid air rising in a column, was far ahead of his time. It earned him the Magellanic Prize of the American Philosophical Society and his nickname, the Storm King. 
but the stumble in his otherwise esteemed career was his intellectual leap to rain making by fire. While many people, not for the most part scientists, believe the loud concussions of artillery caused rain following battles and even Fourth of July celebrations, Espy thought it was the convective heat. He became convinced that cutting and burning huge tracts of forest would bring quenching storms to the arid regions. He proposed that the government maintain gigantic timber lots in a belt from the Great Lakes all the way to the Gulf of Mexico along the western frontier. When rain was needed or even on a regular schedule, some of these lots could be set ablaze. A long curtain of showers would form and sweep eastward across the states to the seaboard, fulfilling farmers' crops and dreams. Espy's critics did not fear his plan would fail, but that it would succeed, placing the power of rainfall into the hands of the federal government. <laughs> the idea especially alarmed antebellum Southerners. He might enshroud us in continual clouds and indeed falsify the promise that the earth should no more be submerged argued a Kentucky senator, and if he possesses the power of causing rain, he may also possess the power of withholding it. Southern congressmen managed to block Espy's proposals for rain by controlled burn through the 1830s and 40s. For years, they would view him as a warning symbol of government control. I would not trust such a power to this Congress, a South Carolina senator declared in the 1850s. Rain is a power which none but God can rule with justice. As long as you leave it to the temptation of selfish man, it will make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Um, so it, it was just a fascinating story. But ultimately, um, when the South seceded, the people who wanted to blast the skies to make it rain, Espy didn't get his way to plant those trees and burn those forests. But after the South seceded, then Congress did pass a rainmaking proposal. And I have uh, an amazing story um, about a federally funded effort to drive, go down to Midland, Texas on, on trains and bring an enormous amount of explosives. And these guys set it up and blasted the sky to try to make it rain. And, and they tried it for a couple of years. It was a really, really amazing. So um, this is, this is the guy um, who was the rain, the chief rainmaker for the federal government. His name was Dry Run Forth, and he's the one with his hands on his, he's the one sitting down with his hands on his knees. So he is the one who brought this incredible, um, incredible train load of stuff down to Midland, Texas to try to make it rain. And, um, the, scientist, the federal scientists at the time did not believe that this was possible. A lot of people during the Civil War thought that, that loud, the loud noises of war, the ordnance, the bombs, and so on, were, were making it rain. And the meteorologists at the time were trying to say, no, the Civil War is being fought in the rainiest region of the country, and that's why it's raining. Um, but, I, but I make a joke that then as now, Congress mind was more open to the influential uninformed than its own scientists. And so they did, um, they did send down this guy. He was a Washington patent lawyer, and they sent him down to Texas to make it rain. And it's just a delightful, delightful story. But these are, these are pictures that ran in Harper's Magazine. They also had enormous balloons. Really reminds me of the Wizard of Oz with that, you know, with that grassy look to it. So um, capturing rain, capturing rain, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead to um, rain and creativity. I have, a, I have a chapter on rain and creativity called Writers on the Storm, W-R-I-T-E-R-S. Um, and, I, and I write about rain as, um, as creative inspiration for many, many writers. It's really interesting to look at the literature of the Little Ice Age because many, um, many famously stormy works like the works of Dickens, you know, come out of that period. But I also looked at, um, I actually looked at 
pop music and grunge. Um, this is Morrissey. On the left is Morrissey, very big pop star who comes from Manchester, which is sort of the UK's city of rain, like we have our Seattle city of rain. And of course, um, our Kurt Cobain, our Kurt Cobain um, came from the city of rain or an even rainier place on the coast. And, and some, um, some people attribute the rise of grunge to to the climate in that part of the world, which I didn't I didn't go so far as to do that, but I had a lot of fun nonetheless with with rain and music and rain and literature. Then I'm gonna uh, I just want to tell you about one other little way of of capturing rain before I finished. Um, one of my favorite trips I took for this book was to a a village in India called Kanaj in the north where um, I, I wanted to do a chapter on the scent of rain. And so I was reading this paper from science from 1964 about where the scent of rain comes from, this, um, this substance called petrichor. And in this paper, the scientist said, yeah, but we're not the first ones who ever thought of that. There's a, there's a village in India where people actually bottle the scent of rain and turn it into the perfume. And I thought, oh my gosh, what if they're still doing that? I, I was sure they wouldn't be still doing it, but I um, started to report on it. And indeed, um, this wonderful fragrance-making village in Kanaj, people still, uh, they dig up the, the dry earth right before the monsoons come and they distill it. It's a very ancient, old-fashioned distillation process. It is the exact same way they distill, you know, rose, rose petals, henna, all of those things, using sandalwood oil, um, boiling it, steaming it in these enormous vats, and it makes a... Um, this is the shopkeeper. So I went to this village, and it was just a wonderful reporting trip because I got to see the making of the rain perfume at every step along the way. And I, um, this was the shopkeeper who sold the perfume, and uh, this was the perfume. And I actually brought the Midi Atar, if anyone wants to smell the rain perfume afterward. So. Um, so that, you know, that's a theme. Not a, we, we aren't just trying to, um, you know, control, control nature, uh, pray for rain, um, bomb the hell out of the skies, all of these things. We, we, try to capture, we try to capture the rain in small ways, too, whether that be a poem or, um, or a small bottle of perfume. So I told you I would get to the part about Miami. And like I said, the book, the book does lead to, to modern times and the climate story. And I have a chapter called City Rains that talks about Miami and Los Angeles um, as microcosms of what we've done to water in our country and sort of how we live with water. And these are the two most interesting cities, right? Right now for rainfall, Miami deals with too much and Los Angeles is in an epic drought dealing with too little. So um, I just had a Wall Street Journal story over the weekend all about the rain revolution going on in Los Angeles because Los Angeles was so you know, drained and ditched and paved over. Um, it's 85% urbanized. So when it rains, and it does rain in Los Angeles even now, but when it rains, it's all captured, you know, that word capture again, and sent out um, in giant storm gutters to the Pacific Ocean. So none of that rain can be used, um, you know, turned into drinking water or trickling back to aquifers, and they're really changing that. There's a wonderful um, rain revolution, if you will, going on in Los Angeles. It's, it's, it's large scale, it's similar to what Miami is doing in that it's a major, major retrofit of the entire stormwater system to be able to deal with dry times in, in this case. So they are doing all kinds of things to capture rain. And Miami is equally interesting on the, other, on the other side of the spectrum. So I was just gonna read you the little, this will be the last thing I read. I'll read you the opening of the chapter city rains because it'll give you a sense of both the reverence for rain that I have and the, the reverence for water in this book, um, but, but also the challenges. And I, I think this is a good approach to, you know, appreciate, appreciate it and, um, 
you know, challenge, challenge what we've done at the same time. Miami is my favorite city of rain. If you've got to endure a deluge, it might as well be warm, fall amid fairy tale banyan trees and Mediterranean architecture and last less than an hour. On the southernmost mainland, rain's applause rings loudest from the palm trees, fronds drumming with steady appreciation all through the wet season. Florida summer afternoons create just the atmospheric chaos a thunderstorm craves. As the sun warms the peninsula through the day, heat begins to rise off the land. Sea breezes swoop in from the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. When these cool, damp drafts collide over the land mass, uh, sorry, they push the warm air higher, sending huge moisture-laden currents aloft. The blue sky puff clouds of morning give way to silver rubens by midday. Through the hot afternoon, these currents soar higher. Cerulean towers build and then vanish in a blue-black squall that dwarfs the beaches, marshes, and skylines of South Florida. As the storm moves in, the sticky air turns cool. The thunder does not rumble in the distance so much as surprise with the closeness of its first sheet metal clang. On the beaches, lifeguards blow their whistles and mothers wrestle wind-whipped blankets. In the Everglades, flocks of white ibis flash in the inky sky as they fly for cover in the hardwood hammocks. In Miami's coconut grove, wiry men selling mangoes on the highway medians make a break for the underpasses. A few plump raindrops fall as five second warnings before everything ordinary vanishes in an all out tropical wash. Rain gives Miami its substance as well as its tropical signature. South Florida's water supply depends entirely on rainfall to fill its aquifers because of what scientists call a hydrologic divide that severs the bottom of Florida from the bubbling springs and inflowing rivers that define the central and northern regions. Without rain, Miami would have no prehistoric looking gumbo limbo trees, no hot pink bougainvillea pouring over walls and trellises, no bananas and plantains with their rain slide leaves that ingeniously empty inward to growing trunks when the plants are small and outward to the root zone when they're mature. Just as rain is the sustenance for tropical fruits, flowers, and trees, it is the balm for the oppressive summer heat of an overbuilt city. Miami's deluges cool off the asphalt streets and sun-beaten rooftops, so hot by afternoon the first drops sizzle to steam. They slow the breakneck traffic on Interstate 95. They sheet down the glass skyscrapers of Brickell Avenue to give workers in the financial district a taste of wild nature in their monolith offices. When the primordial storms move on, they leave Miami's pastel-colored buildings and frangipani trees glowing in a divine luminescence of sunlight streaming through dark clouds. Ever the Janus, rain's intensity in South Florida can also leave burst sewage pipes that foul Biscayne Bay, streets turn to small rivers, parking lots to ponds, and soccer fields that resemble swamps. Like the rainmakers convinced they could blast storms from the sky or bring them on, the developers who dreamed up the cities of South Florida believed human ingenuity could keep capri capricious rain too much or too little in check. In fact, every inch of wetland or forest lost to every new inch of asphalt or concrete blocks rain's return to the aquifers or out to sea, making for an odd mix of human-made scarcity and flooding. Every raised mangrove makes the rising seas, storm surges, and torrential rains associated with climate change that much worse. Miami is not unique in having developed in defiance of its hydrology, but unless the city can mend the mistake, it could be the first metropolis to succumb to it. So um, in the City Rains chapter, I go back and forth between Los Angeles and Miami and talk about um, some of the green infrastructure and some of the other stormwater storm water issues without saying the word stormwater too many times, of course. So um, I, 
let's see. It's hard for me to see. Oh, that's a beautiful um, Miami rain picture. I should have showed you that while I was reading that passage. This is just a quick look at um, my trip to Cherrapunji, the rainiest place on earth. And um, I wanted to end, I wanted to end on this point of, um, of unity as, as rain, uh, of rain bringing us together. So remember when I, when I started, I talked about how even people who don't want to talk about climate change, they love talking about weather, they love talking about rainfall. And I know from going around talking to people about water um, that water and weather are really good ways to talk to people about some of these other issues. And I've, I've become convinced, and that's part of the reason for this book, that water and weather are some of the ways in which the shouting match over climate change becomes a conversation. So even, even like when you're strangers and you're running under a scaffolding and you are stuck together, you just start talking, right? You start talking about the rain. And um, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of those conversations happen. I love the picture. Um, the picture in the upper right is something I write about in the religion chapter. There was this really unprecedented time of, of unity um, last, not this past fall, but, but the fall before um, in Jerusalem when um, Islamic and, and Jewish people came together in this unprecedented measure of peace to pray for rain. And so um, I'd like to end with that image and that thought that I think, uh, think that rain is a unifying force in a fractured world. So I'm really, really appreciative of you coming, and I'd be happy to answer questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Yes. Well, I want to uh, congratulate you for your remarks. They were very interesting and very educational. And today I heard you on the radio. Yes. And you were talking about seeding the clouds. Yes. Can you please talk about what seeding the clouds? I don't have the faintest idea. Sure. Thank you. I will. I will. Let me go, let me go to that chapter. This is... Um, so I talked to you about the rainmakers. There was a point, there was a point at which quacks were going around the country telling people that they could make rain. But in fact, um, science, science can make rain, um, not, not as efficiently as some people wish. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you the little, the little story about it. Um, it was actually, I'm trying to find, it was GE. Uh, the GE company in the 1950s was doing um, research on cloud seeding. Uh, not cloud seeding, but it was doing other uh, cloud research that was related to war. The government wanted to be able to create clouds that could cover military vehicles moving along. So they wanted to be able to hide stuff. Um, and so there was a lot of this really interesting. There would be us. Yeah, there was a lot of really interesting research being funded. Here you go. Um, so they were working on aircraft icing, gas, gas mask filters, and screening smokes, which the Germans had used in 1941 to hide the battleship Bismarck in the fjords of Norway. So at the General Electric Research Laboratory in uh, Schenectady, New York, this research team was working on those things, you know, creating clouds to be able to hide stuff. And um, I'm just going to read you, I'm going to read you the point where they discover how this works. As the GE scientists worked, they became fascinated with more basic cloud questions, such as why not all supercooled clouds, those containing liquid water droplets with temperatures below freezing, could make snow. Serendipity helped figure it out. On a warm July day, Schaefer plunked some dry ice into a small freezer he was using as a cloud chamber to try to cool it down. Immediately, the cold cloud inside the chamber formed millions of tiny ice crystals. He removed the large chunk of dry ice and tossed in smaller and smaller crystals. 
it turns out that supercooled droplets need super small bits or nuclei to cling to before they can make snowflakes or raindrops. So in other words, in other words, um, scientists figured out that if they put nuclei into the cloud, if they put a, a, a cloud needs, a raindrop needs a little tiny something to cling to before it will rain. It needs a little bit of dust or a little bit of ice or something. And so w what they figured out was that if you put nuclei in a cloud, if it was going to rain anyway, you can get a little rain out of it. The, the thing is, GE and these scientists, they just thought this was huge. Um, I have, some, I have some funny quotes from the New York Times. Um, GE lost no time in asking the military for access to a better airplane that could fly higher and higher into clouds. This was after they had tried it one time and they made it snow. Um, in releasing the news to the, to the New York Times, the paper crowed the next day that numerous practical applications are expected to result from this project, including storage of moisture in the winter for spring irrigation, water power programs, steering heavy snowfall away from cities, and providing snow for winter resorts. And the Times quoted the, Times quoted the main scientist as saying, a pellet of dry ice the size of a pea could create enough nuclei for several tons of snow. So at the time, in the 1950s, they were so excited when they learned this that they really thought they were going to solve all of our water problems this way. And in fact, seeding goes on right now. There's major cloud seeding all over the western United States, and there's a huge cloud seeding project in China. In fact, before the Beijing Olympics, um, the Chinese shot their clouds early so that they would rain, so that it would not rain on the Olympics. So um, this is done, but the problem is, again, the only thing they can do is make a cloud rain that was going to rain anywhere, anyway. So the interesting question is, if you make it rain, and this has come up, if you make it rain, and, and the people who hire the cloud seeders are often ski resorts in, the, in, our, in our western United States, so if you make it rain, if you make it snow over a ski resort in Utah, are you taking away the water that was going to, um, you know, float down a little farther and, and rain on someone else that is, you know, suffering in dry time? So it's a fascinating, fascinating story. I, I wish I had more time to talk about it, but I, I devote a chapter to this in the book. And as you may have heard on the radio, GE got out of the business. Um, the, the ultimate experiment was, well, if we, can, if we can manipulate clouds, then we should be able to steer hurricanes away from populated areas. So there was a hurricane that had formed um, off the coast of Jacksonville, and they sent a plane from McDill Air Force Base to fly into that hurricane and uh, shoot it full of um, the cloud seeding nuclei to try to dispel it, to try to make it go out into the Atlantic Ocean. Well, instead, the hurricane turned and it slammed into Savannah. And so when that happened, and, and many meteorologists said, you guys did not turn that hurricane. That hurricane was going to turn anyway. But actually, the, the character in the book, the person who was the head of the National Hurricane Center in Miami, believed very fervently that they had turned that hurricane into Savannah. So when the GE lawyers learned that GE was involved in something like that, it was the legal liability. It was the lawyers who said, we don't want anything to do with this. And the unfortunate thing about the hurricane situation and the hurricane hitting Savannah is that that's pretty interesting research. There were meteorologists here in Miami who really wanted to work on the idea of whether we could turn hurricanes away from land. But that was so awful and controversial when that hurricane turned towards Savannah and no one knew, you know, no one could prove whether it was purposeful or not. That stymied hurricane dissipation research for like half a century. It only has just started back now after Hurricane Katrina. Um, they're doing the research again, and a lot of it is funded by Bill Gates. So, 
It's a pretty interesting, it's a pretty interesting part of the story. Yeah. <laughs> Should I, two, so two, we have time for a few more, so I'll take yours. Yeah, you had your hand up. Quick question, do we know if these droughts are related to global warming or natural weather, weather patterns? Yeah, are you referring to the drought in California? Yeah, yeah. So in, in general, and, and this makes sense, the drier earth becomes, uh, I mean the hotter earth becomes, the more water vapor will occur in the, in the atmosphere and that will create more rainfall in places where it already rains, you know, places like Miami or, or rainy places. But dry places, it'll mean greater evaporation. So dry places, um, computer models say that dry places will become drier and wet places will become wetter, but the scientists say they can't attribute any one emergency to climate change. So they can't take, um, you know, Hurricane Sandy, Katrina, um, the drought, whatever it is. I have a, there is a very, very interesting study that I cite where um, meteorologists working together in the UK and the United States pick 12 major weather events, including Hurricane Sandy, um, the, the epic drought on the plains, and 10 other events globally, and they, they did their computer modeling to try to figure out would this have happened without that warming. In half the cases, those things all would have happened anyway, and in half the cases, they thought they could attribute them to climate change. So, you had a question. I was wondering if you have any of these wonderful photos in the book. No, I'm so sad to tell you that this book does not contain photos. And I wanted photos in the book, but these are all financial decisions. Okay. Yeah. Did you do any research on Mesoamerica, the Mayans? Yes. And that whole idea that due to lack of water is why that civilization Yes, might have yes. We, so we know that many, of, uh, many civilizations have collapsed due to epic drought, including the Mayan civilization. And the other, the inter the other interesting thing about them is that they sacrificed their very smallest very smallest children to the rain god. Their rain god was a teeny tiny male god. And so when the archaeologists dig up some of these graves from the sacrifices, they are, they are male infants because they were trying to replicate that little tiny rain god as best they could to try to make it rain. That's how you know, incredibly desperate they were. But, but again, I, I think the amazing part of the story is that we survived. We survived, ultimately humanity survived these um, incredible droughts, the inc you know, incredible drought of 4,000 years ago, and as well, as well as the little ice age and those, those extreme times. Thank you. Yes. In the, uh, the radio program, you talked about your love of rain yes. and the shape of the rain drop. Yes. How did you uh, deal with that most beautiful phenomena, rainbows? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just described, I, I described what makes a rainbow. And I can read you that little bit because it sort of plays in to the theme of the book that um, if you, if you describe a, a rainbow um, in, in two scientific terms, do you take away, um, do you take away the beauty for people? Um, let's see if I can find it. <coughs> now, if they didn't put rainbow in my index, I'll be, I'll be amazed. I may not be able to find it. Anyway, what I, what I did was I, um, I described the science of a, of a rainbow, um, the refraction of, of light through the drops, but I tried not to ruin the beauty and the poetry of the rainbow as I described the science. And I, I wish I could find this little bit, but crazily, the rainbow isn't in the index. I'll have to talk to the indexer about that. <laughs> Does well, anyone else have a question? Here. Victor, thank, thank you, you so much, much for having me. Right. Yeah.
That's a nice umbrella. Very yeah, tall. Yeah. That's huge. All right, folks. So if there are no more questions, then we have Rain as well as uh, Cynthia's previous titles for sale at the counter in the front room over there. She's going to be signing over there at the table to the right of the screen. And this has been so interesting. And Let's give Ms. Barnett another Thank Did you. you. Really no, I was just going to tell them that I have the Rain perfume if anyone oh, wants great. to smell okay. it. Thank you very much. Thank you.